when you're evaluating an orchestra and their ability to cross strings, you have to ask two questions. What are you hearing and what are you seeing? Both the visual information that you're getting from your students and what you're hearing to get information from your students, it's going to tell you a lot about what they're doing and how to fix maybe some of the, the problems that you're hearing or seeing. So let's talk about what you're hearing first. Let's talk about the, the problem where students are playing an open string in between the string crossing. So they're fingering a passage on one string and then as they're crossing strings, they release that string, you hear the open string, and then you hear a note on the next string up or down. This is happening because there's a lack of coordination in between the left hand and the right hand. The left hand is either re releasing that string, the finger's coming off the string earlier than it needs to, or it could be that the finger is coming down later than it needs to on the next string. So an example of this, let's say that your orchestra is playing a piece in E minor, and let's say that your cello section is, you know, they're playing a, a dominant to tonic um, emphasis where they have to play a B on the G string and then an E on the D string. So here a couple of things can happen. They're playing the B and then they're releasing the, the string early or they're lifting up their fingers early and then you hear that open G, just that little blip before the bow makes it over to the D string to play the E. For maybe the crossing strings too fast because they're playing the B and then you hear the open D before they can get that first finger down. So you're probably thinking like, oh, well, you know, I watched the last video on rules and, you know, why don't they just have the third finger down for, for the B and then the first finger down on the, on the D string? Yeah, that's a good point, but maybe they're not there in their technique. Maybe they haven't started working on double stops yet and they still have left hand problems and that's just not going to be an option right now. So how do you work out those coordination issues? And, and another thing is that, yes, we can mask that coordination issue by using a different technique, and that's all well and good. But there's still going to be a problem there that we need to address because we're not always going to be able to use that. And so in, in the accountability section, I'm going to give you some tips to how to make that happen to where we can start to develop that coordination and the students are going to be held accountable to not having that open string occur in between those two notes. So the next thing that you might be hearing in your orchestra when they're changing strings, when they're crossing strings, is you might hear gritty tone. So using the same example that we did earlier, you know, the, the cellos are playing that B on the G string, and then all this, you know, the B sounds good, and then right before they cross strings, you kind of hear some scratchiness, and then uh, it fixes itself when they move to the next string. So in between the strings, the string crossings, it's just really gritty sound. These tone problems are more likely to occur on slurs rather than detache notes, and they're more likely to occur when slurring from a down bow to a lower string to a down bow to a, a higher string, and from an up bow to a higher string to an up bow to a lower string. The reason being is that when we bow a down bow and then we slur and, and cross strings to an upper string, we lose a little bit of bow from one string to the next. And when we go up bow, we lose a little bow and kind of get a little closer to the frog um, as we go to the next bow. So you can kind of visualize this like riding an escalator. If you're the one riding the escalator, you know, and you're going up an escalator and you take a step back, to you, it appears like you're going down, but to everybody else that's not on the escalator, you're actually staying in the same spot. And the same thing if you're going down an escalator and you take a step back, you know, it might appear that you're going higher, but you're actually staying in the same spot there too. And, and the same thing with the, with the bow. When you're crossing strings, you know, you, your bow is traveling this way, but from string to string, it's like skipping a step. And so what happens is that there's an artificial reduction in bow speed and the bow can slip. And so that's why sometimes we get that gritty sound. But sometimes you'll hear that gritty sound anyway. You know, you'll, you'll hear that gritty sound with the detache bowing. And maybe the students are just slowing down the bow or stopping the bow in between strings, which can be very common with beginners. 
Because if you think about it and, and you stage it, and we, when we do one of our demos, we kind of stage it this way just to show students how to cross strings. You know, it, it's three separate actions, right? So rather than performing all of these actions at the same time, they stage them independently. You know, it's like, okay, I'm gonna cross strings, then bow, you know, and that's what you're hearing in the sound. Okay, so now I wanna talk about things that you can see in your orchestra to troubleshoot the sound. And the first thing I wanna talk about here are the left hand wrists. And it's a very common tendency for students when they play on their highest string to twist the wrist to get to that string, to access that string, rather than to move the shoulder, rotate the shoulder and tuck the fingers in. This is extremely common with violinists on the E string, with violists on the A string. You even see it in cellists, cell cellists that, that twist the wrist to play on the A string and bass players as well to play on the G string. Maybe not as common for them, but um, you, you see this a lot. And so when you have students that are crossing strings, you might hear the tone change a little more than it should. You know, each string has its own color, but uh, on, the, on the highest strings, you might hear just some really bad tone and it might be because the left hand shape has changed and so the sound is going to change. So yes, we talk about crossing strings with the bow, but how do we cross strings with the left hand? That's also very important. If students don't play with a straight bow, it's very difficult to coordinate string crossings. So I use that escalator example of somebody going up an escalator and going down a step or up a step. The escalator's linear, you know, it's straight, they're going up this way. What if that escalator was like a spiral, going up in a, in a spiral escalator staircase type of thing? <laughs> you could picture something out of Willy Wonka. Well, now if you're climbing steps and uh, being moved upwards or downwards, depending on the direction of the spiral staircase, your orientation is going to be way off. It's going to be way off to you and to somebody looking at the person on the staircase because of the change in, in vectors and directions. Well, it's the same thing if your bow is crooked and you're trying to cross strings, as you're moving the bow from, from frog to tip or from tip to frog, that orientation is changing as well. So it's like you're creating the spiral staircase effect and that's going to affect your string crossing and you're going to end up with a lot more of the unintentional open strings, you're gonna end up with a lot more gritty tone in between strings. And that's just a way to, tr to help troubleshoot those because before we can fix anything else, we gotta fix that straight bow. In the first video of this episode, I talked about uh, the function of the wrist and elbow and, and who leads the dance. Now, let's assume for a moment that uh, a student is holding their bow incorrectly. Um, let's say they've got a straight thumb or they've got some kind of a, a a pinky extension thing going on and that tension is locking their wrist up. Well, that's going to be a big problem because the wrist is may sometimes lead the dance and if the wrist is the one leading the dance and the wrist is locked, that's a huge problem. But if the elbow is leading the dance, the wrist still has to follow the elbow and that's going to be a big problem too. So now the elbow is always leading the dance and the elbow is the only one dancing. The elbow does not have a dance partner because the wrist is, is locked. So before we can even get into the nuances of, okay, what is the wrist doing? What is the, what is the elbow doing? We're gonna have to fix those bolts. And, and this is why you get students that are very hardworking and they're very polished and precise with the left hand and they can play very quick passages, but they never seem to be able to make that all region ensemble, they never seem to be able to break into the all state ensembles or Texas state solo ensemble. It's because there's something wrong with their bow hold. And so when it comes to a string crossing where it should be a wrist led string crossing passage, they're unable to do that because the wrist is locked and it, it just throws everything off enough to where they just can't break into that because of their technique. And when you're playing easier music, that, that doesn't do that, you know, you can, you can get away with a lot of bad technique and still kind of make it sound okay. But once you get into the more advanced music, those technique problems are a huge limiting factor. Shoulder rotation in the left arm is very important. On all of the instruments, 
we have to rotate the shoulder this way or this way to be able to access the string and have our left hand shape be consistent. Earlier I talked about how students will twist the wrist to play on the higher string, that's very common too. But on lower strings, we'll see students trying to extend the fingers instead of rotate the shoulder. Uh, we see this on, on cellos and basses quite a bit, and then they have bad tone and they play out of tune, which will affect their string crossing. And you know, we'll see this on, on violins and violas as well on, on the G string, you know, we, so that they don't have that nice, strong G string tone. We also see lack of shoulder position and shoulder rotation in the left hand too, uh, which is a big problem. And sometimes we'll see over rotation. And so lack of rotation, basically they're, they're trying to do everything with the wrist because the shoulder isn't positioning the elbow where it's supposed to be. And that's going to make for some sloppy string crossings. And then we have students that are doing everything with the shoulder, including bowing with the shoulder. And instead of using you know, the elbow and wrist for straight bow, and, and that's just gonna make for some really sloppy playing in general. When we think about what it takes to make a straight bow, we have to have two active joints, okay? Wrist and elbow, okay? Wrist and fingertips, elbow and shoulder. Depending on what part of the bow we're playing and what we're doing, we have to have two or else we're creating arcing shapes instead of straight lines. So it's the same thing when we're crossing strings. We have to have two joints working together. It can't be all with the shoulder or else it's going to move us out of position. And it's also gonna change our bowing angle. And that's an enormous problem because then again, we lose our consistency and we lose our ability to anticipate when the sound is going to change when we are vibrating one string with the bow to the next string. Students who don't have proper wrist flexibility tend to play exclusively in the upper half of the bow uh, and exclusively at the tip. And with cellos and basses, a lot of times you'll see the opposite being true. You'll see them exclusively playing right at the frog instead of being able to play in the middle and upper half of the bow because that takes more wrist and, and elbow motion, whereas they can do all of this with the shoulder. But in any case, this will affect the string crossing too because if they're Violence of violas are always playing in the upper half. Sometimes they have a passage where they have to go back and forth from string to string, and it's going to be, if they have to do it quickly, it's going to be very, very difficult if they're doing it at the tip as opposed to the balance point or, or somewhere in the lower half of the bow where they have to move much less. So if the students aren't used to or comfortable playing in the lower half of the bow in general, you know, for violence and violas, it's gonna be very difficult for them to play those passages. In, in the same way for your low strings, cellos and basses, if they're playing exclusively, you know, like all of their eighth notes and quarter notes at the frog, they're going to probably encounter a passage where they have a long note duration. Maybe it's a whole note and it's connected to another whole note and that other whole note is on a different string. Well, now suddenly they're in a very unfamiliar part of the bow. And so it's gonna make for some really clunky string crossings because they're not used to playing there in general, so they, they have a hard time anticipating one string to the next, so you're gonna hear a lot of unintentional open strings. The other thing that you're going to see quite a bit is students collapsing fingers. Um, you'll see this in general, but particularly on string crossings where the students don't have good shoulder rotation, they will end up collapsing their fingers instead of creating these tabletops up here, which means rounded left hand shapes. Now, yes, I understand that sometimes we're gonna do that and sometimes in the upper positions, our, our fingers are going to extend a little bit more and we have finger extensions that are gonna stretch a little bit more. So again, you know, be flexible with these techniques, but in general, you know, we're playing in first position and we're starting to see fingers collapse in first position, that's probably not a good thing. And if a student has this general problem in their technique, the string crossing is going to magnify this error. So again, when diagnosing String crossing problems in an orchestra, what are you seeing, what are you hearing? That's going to give you a good idea on how to fix the sound that you're hearing, you know, based on, you know, open, open strings or scratchy tone or all these different things that you're seeing. It's gonna make string crossing much easier if you can troubleshoot.